The High Middle Ages take place mostly in Paris. So everything we're going to talk about takes place in Paris from about 1150 to 1300. The three main categories of this chapter are Gothic architecture, scholasticism, which is a philosophical idea we'll delve into, and the birth of the university. The culture of the Middle Ages derives from two sources. First of all, the humane learning of Greece and Rome, and remember that those texts came to the West through um, the Islamic world. There was a rediscovery of texts through the Muslim world, through the House of Wisdom at Baghdad. And so those ancient texts of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates came through that avenue. And then, of course, the Judeo-Christian worldview, which accounts for the pilgrimages that we'll talk about in this chapter for the Holy Crusades that took place, the war across Europe for hundreds of years, and then finally reforms in the church. It is interesting that the word Gothic came from the Goths. The Goths, remember, were those Germanic groups who invaded the Roman Empire and helped cause the fall of the Roman Empire. And the word Gothic itself was originally intended as an insult. It was first used by Vasari, who was an Italian biographer of artist, and he used it to refer to something rude or barbaric, even, um, you know, to describe art that was rude or barbaric. But the Gothic style lost this negative connotation sometime in the 18th century. And now, of course, the connotation is very positive because this is a style that you see in cathedrals all across Europe. The Gothic style began with Abbot Sujet at the Abbey of Saint Denis in um, right outside of Paris. And when Sujet became the abbot there, he wanted to create something new. The abbey was receiving a lot of visits. Remember, the pilgrimages were where strong, um, primarily Catholics, would go and they would go to visit whatever cathedral probably that was closest to them where there were relics. A relic is some bit of bone or some bit of cloth, something that was associated from the time period of Christ, whether it be from Christ himself or from one of his apostles, or maybe a piece of wood from a boat that Christ sailed in. So various cathedrals would have pieces of that time period called relics and so people would go on pilgrimages to show their devotion to Christ to view these relics or maybe to, to view the tomb of a saint. So um, Abbot Suget built a new church in 1124 and he wanted to build it in a new style. And this style came to be known as Gothic. Gothic the Gothic style is characterized primarily by verticality, which means going up straight, very high, and luminosity which is the stained glass windows, which is um, letting the, the light of God in. The Gothic cathedral has many parts. The cathedral itself is associated with um, pointed arches and higher walls. The inside of the cathedral had ribbing, so various kinds of ribs, they were called, that were used so that the ceilings could go higher and higher and the ribs were used to take the weight of the walls and the ceiling so it could be built higher. On the outside of the cathedral, a structure called a flying buttress was used to take the weight um, of the building itself so again that it could go higher and higher and of course the verticality was to point to God. So you can see in your textbook page 307 all of the different parts of the Gothic cathedral. I am particularly interested in that you know what a rib is and what a flying buttress is. And what you see on this slide are just the basic parts of the cathedral. The narthex, which is the porch or vestibule. In your home, you might call it the foyer, where you first enter. The nave, which is the main part of the church, which is where all the people sit. Um, before you get to the altar, so that's the central space of the church. The choir, where monks sing the office, um, and it's like our modern day choir loft, but it didn't necessarily occur after the altar. Oftentimes the choir was running down two sides of the nave, and what the word office there means is the liturgy of the church. 
the months would sing that liturgy in kind of a sing-song chanting idea, like we talked about from the early Christian church. This is carrying over here to 11, 1200. The apse, which is the semicircular end of a church where the altar is found. So that it's semicircular, wherever you see the high altar where the priest would be speaking. And behind that high altar is the ambulatory. That's the aisle around it. And there is often um, lots of little rooms that would come off the ambulatory, small, um, smaller chapels where one could go and sit and worship, you know, much smaller than the nave of the church. In addition to verticality, the other aspect of Gothic architecture is luminosity, which means light. And of course, that is referring to the light of God. It's based on the mysticism of light that every created being is a small light. And as the light becomes purer, one is closer to God, who is pure light. The Lux Nova is the saying that this is based on. And it is bright is that which is brightly coupled with the bright. And bright is the noble edifice which is pervaded by the new light. And this can be found in your textbook. Second column, top of page 312, the Lux Nova, because the stained glass windows in the church were all based upon this idea. They weren't just beautiful creations. They represented God um, as the God of light. And so these stained glass windows were used to express this light mysticism. And, you know, as you know, perhaps from, because you've been there or because you've been in a cathedral, the stained glass windows are probably the predominating piece of architecture that you will notice in a Gothic cathedral. This is an example of a stained glass window. This is Notre Dame de Belle Verrier at Chart Cathedral. Chart Cathedral um, is a a cathedral in a town south of Paris that had 173 windows. And what the name of this um, particular window translates to is Our Lady of the Beautiful Window. And the Our Lady is Mary, who is right in the middle of the window with Christ behind her. The glass here is not painted. Each piece of glass is individually dyed. Um, and so in the Middle Ages, you had the guilds and the guild was a cross between a union and a social club, and it was associated with a particular occupation, whether that be um, the bakers or the shipbuilders. And these guilds would sponsor different windows that they would um, pay for and put in the cathedral. So it was a mark of pride to have a beautiful stained glass window from a guild. And so at Chart, they were particularly known for the color red. You can see the red that is in the middle behind Christ and Mary, that is called sharp red, and they had a particular method of dyeing to produce that color. So each individual piece of glass is put together with lead, and you can, you can see the lead in the background, and of course the big, the big panes where lead is used to put it together. Um, and these were so important because as we have noted, most of the populace um, was not educated. They could not read. And so these stained glass windows were called the Bible of the poor because they educated people in the stories from the Bible. And this one is about Mary. Um, and the, the idea that is associated with luminosity at, <clears throat> is that just as Christ passed through Mary's body, that's the same way that light passes through a window. It keeps it totally intact without changing the glass and also without changing Mary. And Chart, the whole cathedral is devoted to Mary. It's, Chart was the seat of learning and Mary is considered the, um, is of course the woman of wisdom and of learning and so she provides that moral example. So there's, there's not, it's not just a beautiful piece of art to look at. There was very much associated with a lot of symbolism um, associated with these stained glass windows. There are pictures in your textbook, pages 310 and 311 of both the cathedral at Chart, 
and of Notre Dame. Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is probably the most famous building in the world. It is certainly the most famous example of Gothic architecture. And what is unusual is that builders and theologians work together to build these cathedrals and so that there was a, a very functional, practical point of view for each part of cathedral, but also a spiritual point of view. And one example of that is the gargoyles on Notre Dame. These gargoyles were actually water spouts for the rain to run off and run through, but the spiritual function is they were saying that evil flees the church through these gargoyles. So there is just so much um, with the cathedrals. I encourage you to look in your textbook at some of the carvings, some of the statues that you see on the cathedrals on pages 314 and page 315, because each one of the statues, much like our Greek and Roman buildings, had a significance. We have the lives of the saints represented, the life of Christ, the life of Mary represented in, in these carvings, and as I've already said, in the stained glass windows, so that people who went there were not just edified by the beauty, but they were able to learn something about what the Bible said. So what were the functions of the cathedral in a medieval town? First of all, the cathedral usually overwhelmed the town physically. It was usually built on the highest point in the town and was the largest building in the town. And it was the center of town life, not only for religious purposes, but for educational. Once schools started up a little later during this time period, they off, the schools were often housed in the cathedral. It was a social um, point for the for the community where they came together for any celebrations. And it was also economic because you needed a good cathedral in order to get pilgrims to come to your town and spend money on food, on hotels. Um, so it provided an economic aspect for the town. It also controlled the regularity of life. Most cathedrals had a bell tower and that bell tower would ring at point, various points during the day, you know, reminding people of um, breakfast, lunch, time to go to work, time to come home from work, dinner, whatever the, was going on in the town. So that's how it controlled the regularity of life. And um, it also brought outsiders to the town. It was a big venture to decide to build a cathedral because it took a lot of money and it took a lot of time and it was a whole community affair and the guilds were involved in it, as we'll talk about on the next slide. The guild is that fraternal society of craftsmen and merchants. Remember, it is a cross between a union and a social club and it is associated with a particular occupation so that all the men who worked at a particular job would belong to a certain guild. They did contribute charitable works to the town. For instance, let's just say that one of the men who is building ships falls from the mast from the highest point of the ship and breaks his leg. Well, he's not able to work. So the members of the shipbuilders guild would take care of that man's family while he was recovering so that they would not go hungry. So, you know, it performed a service much like our government does today in taking care of poor and sick, and then as they got older, of older people. So they did take care of their members. And if anything was needed in town, if somebody's house built down, burnt down, then the guild would go back to rebuild that home. And they would donate, as I mentioned earlier, they would donate stained glass windows to the cathedrals. They also sponsored plays. These plays were about um, the stories in the Bible or the life of a saint, and so they needed sponsorship as well. So they were important for not not just for taking care of people in town, but also also for the arts. They um, provided a lot to medieval art. This is from the bottom left corner of an entire piece of stained glass that was set into Chartres Cathedral um, in France. And what this is, is this identifies which guild donated that stained glass window to the cathedral. 
because the guilds didn't want credit for what they did for their good works. And so this is called a roundel. Just, it's very small, just a small little piece at the bottom of the stained glass window. And this shows who the guild was. In this case, the guild is from the Venter, the winemakers, because you can see him on his horse with the wine barrel in the back of his wagon. And it's from about 1215. The center of Gothic music was at the School of Notre Dame in Paris. And just as so many other things were changing during this time period, so was music. The music was changing from the early music of the Christian church. Remember that we had the cantor, who often led the congregation in a type of singing called responsorial, which basically was a chanting of different parts of psalms. And so now it's changing and more melody um, is being added to this music. It's not quite to the level of the church choirs that we hear today, which, which have the many voices, soprano, alto, bass, and tenor, but it's, it's on its way. So some terms that are important are polyphony. Now polyphony means many voices, and that is the type of music that we have today in our churches. The church choir that you would hear is polyphonous. An early form of polyphony is organum, and that's what we had during this time period was organum. We had, first of all, you had one song, one, one person singing on just a couple of notes, and we go up and down with that. It's called plain, plain song. And this was introduced during the time of Charlemagne, which is in the previous chapter that we did not cover, um, a type that's called Gregorian chant. Some of you may have heard Gregorian chant before, but that is what we have with organum. And then other voices were added to that. The cantus firmus, it means fixed song. And that is the basic melodic line of a traditional chant. And that's what we started with, with Gregorian chant. And then during this time period, they added new melodies, both above and below that one cantus firmus. One thing they added was the counterpoint, which means going against the note, we would call it harmony. So that was added. And then finally, they progressed to a motet, which is adding words in. A motet, um, would be where they added words to fragments of Gregorian chant. And this didn't happen until the very end of the High Middle Ages. Now that middle word there, troubadour, is associated with the third bullet point with secular music. While the vast majority of music during this time period is associated with the cathedral, there was some secular, secular music that was composed by the knightly classes and um, the troubadours sang it. A troubadour, is a French musician who composed songs about love and chivalry. So you see how that connects, connects that it was composed by the knightly classes. Here in this time period, we have the rise of the medieval university. Remember that universities were first started during ancient Greece by Plato and Aristotle, and then continued in some form during the Roman Empire but after the Roman Empire fell, they just went away. Remember that another term for Middle Ages is Dark Ages because there was not much learning during the first part of the Middle Ages. We are at the end of the Middle Ages called the High Middle Ages. So there is the rise of the university for several reasons that you see here. Life was becoming more complicated. They needed an educated class who could support the socioeconomic needs of the town. They rediscovered the ancient works, and remember that came through the Islamic world, through the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, and also coming from the House of Wisdom, remember the invention of algebra, and more scientific and mathematical information. So, and also there was a renaissance of legal studies. Lawyers were starting to become a thing. So they needed universities to educate their people. And the most prestigious of the universities began during the Middle Ages. The one that we'll be talking the most about is the University of Paris, but also there was the University of Bologna, which is in Italy, and Oxford and Cambridge, which were in England. 
Before this, any learning that had gone on primarily took place in the monasteries. Scholasticism developed from dialectics. I encourage you to read the highlighted box at the top of page 321 in your textbook about dialectics. It came from ancient Greece and was a technique used to come to logical conclusions based on a rigorous style of reasoning. If that sounds like debate to you, then that's what it is. It was um, debate and it was used by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and it's what was taught to the wealthy young men who were going to rule during that time period. So that, since they were rereading Aristotle and Plato during this time period, dialectics came to the forefront, but they were doing a different kind of study during this time period because of the influence of Christianity. So they're studying theology and philosophy, and so they applied the ancient Greek technique of dialectics to the newer studies of theology and philosophy. And so this is what is known as scholasticism. It was combining conflicting opinions concerning theology with contradictory passages in the Bible and then trying to reconcile them, which sounds a little foreign to our ears, but that's what they were doing. The, the, um, the professors of the university had three duties. They had to explain scripture, they had to preach it, and then dispute it. And that's where scholasticism comes into play. They had to set out Christian doctrine in some logical deform, form and debate it and find those contradictory passages and debate them, um, explain them. And the most famous of the scholastic scholars was the famous University of Paris teacher, Peter Abelard. He wrote Sic Egnon, um, in which he used scholasticism to explain scripture. Abelard is also very famous because he had, um, of course, he was a priest. That's what m most of the professors at these medieval universities were priests. And he had an affair with a student named Heloise, and she became pregnant. And so they had secretly had a son and were married. Um, but then in a very Romeo Juliet turn of events, um, Abelard died and then later um, Heloise died. And so they were, they have now been buried together at the University of Paris. Medieval universities awarded both master and doctor degrees. First of all, keep in mind that it was overwhelmingly male. There were, might have been rare exceptions, but it was just men who went to university. And it was, first it was called a universitas, and that simply meant a guild or a corporation. So it was like a business. It was just later on that they were called universities as centers of learning. So they awarded a master degree, and just like a regular liberal arts degree like we have today, your bachelor degree, but it was called a master degree when they completed their course of study in rhetoric and logic and all of the, the um, subjects that we have today, they would have received a master of arts degree. And then from that, they could go on to do specialized training in either theology, law, or medicine, and they would receive a doctor degree. The most famous of these universities, as I already mentioned, was the University of Paris and that was because of its professors. They recruited professors from abroad, and the best of that time um, were considered to be the, the ones who were at the University of Paris. The school was split between the arts and the theology students, and from that came the formation of the Latin Quarter, and the arts students moved to the left bank, and it called the Latin Quarter, and it's still there today. You may have heard of the left bank. Um, the school itself, which was about 5,000 to 8,000 students, um, and unlike today, they weren't big on diversity. They split the school into the different countries that they came from. And so, you know, all of the students from England would be together, all of the students from Italy, and that's how you lived and worked and went to classes with the students from um, your particular 
nation. Most of university life was tied to the church, and so there were times for going to mass and private reflection. If you'll look in your textbooks, page 324, you will see the typical schedule of a student at the University of Paris. Um, they get up at 4 a.m. They have to go to mass at 6 a.m. And so and they go to bed at 9. It's, it's quite a rigorous day. Um, as mentioned, students came from all across Europe. One person, Robert de Saborn, underwrote a hospice for graduate students. And a hospice didn't mean what it means today. It was not where you went to die. It was um, a home for graduate students, a place that they could live. And he sponsored them so it wouldn't cost so much. And it was for graduate students in theology. And that particular um, home was the forerunner of the Sorbonne, which is a very famous university in Paris today. This painting is not included in the current edition of our textbook, but I like it, so I kept it in the slideshow. Um, there is a similar um, piece of art, but it is a sculpture that's in your textbook, page 322, that is showing the exact same thing. And the idea is that students have not changed. <laughs> um, this is a manuscript illumination. So that, that means it's from a book and it was painted into a book that was written. Um, and it can be found at the State Museum in Berlin. And so you see that we have some students in the back who are not really paying attention, one who appears to be sleeping. The students in the front are paying a little more attention. Um, but, but look at the professor. He is elevated up on this kind of altar type thing. And it looks like um, he uses steps to get up into it. He's high above and he is just reading from the book. Some students have books, some don't. It's just highly interesting, I think, to see the similarities and the differences between students of a thousand years ago and students today. As you might imagine, during this time period, there were very, there were several very famous men who were monks and priests who then became saints of the Catholic Church that we still venerate today. One such was St. Francis of Assisi. He was born in Italy and he grew up the son of wealthy parents, though he was a bit undisciplined as a youth. Um, he got in trouble in the military and so they put him in solitary confinement and that was a turning point for him. While he was there in solitary, he started thinking about his life and saw how privileged he was and turned away from his wealth gave away all of his goods, gave away all of his wealth, and turned to a life of prayer and self-denial. So people started following him and all over um, Europe, and his simple lifestyle um, appealed to people. And by 1218, there were over 3,000 little brothers. He started a type um, of brotherhood called the mendicant brotherhood which means traveling and taking care of people they were it was a mobile brotherhood and the people who followed him were called little brothers and as i said there were three thousand such orders by the time that he died he identified very closely with the humanity of christ so much so that he has what is called stigmata, S-T-I-G-M-A-T-A, -A, where the wounds that Christ had on the insides of his hands and on his feet appeared on St. Francis of Assisi. He preached a very positive religious faith and he praised all of creation. He had very much a concern for the poor. And one way that people remember him today is that he is associated with animals. Um, you might find a garden shop statue of him. It is said that he preached to the birds. There is um, a scene from his life in which it shows him preaching to the birds. Um, so he is associated with nature and with animals. He did believe that the gospels could be followed literally. So 
he meditated on crucifixion and then his body bore the marks of that crucifixion which was the stigma stigmata one thing about the mendicant brotherhood is that as they traveled around they begged they had their call they were called the begging order because when they went to cities to take help take care of people they had to beg for for their food and for their lodging so here is the detail of the altarpiece where he is shown preaching to the birds. If you will look at the middle panel to the left of the main figure of St. Francis, then you will see that. You'll see the birds um, on that figure as he is preaching to them. This is in your textbook, page 332, and these are scenes from the life of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Thomas Aquinas is known as an intellectual mystic. He is a friar from Italy. He came from a very noble family, actually was related to some of the Holy Roman emperors, and his family thought that he would go in that direction. He did not. I mean, he stayed, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, and he was a priest, but he didn't go into the politics. He went into the priesthood, and they were so disturbed by this that actually they had him kidnapped and tried to make him change his mind, but he did not. He became known as the most famous of the and influential of the Parisian masters. And one reason for that is that he tried to hold the middle ground between fitism and rationalism. Fitism says that religious faith is an absolute and is indifferent to the mm -hmm. efforts of human reason, relies on faith alone, and there's, you should not attempt to use logic or reason. Rationalism is that everything must meet the test of rational human scrutiny, including the scriptures, including faith. And there were two big categories of this. I mean, the people in the university were rationalists and the common person was a fittest. So he tried to hold the common ground between these two. And he argued for that in his masterpiece, Summa Theological, which stated the relationship between reason and revelation. And he argued for five arguments for the existence of God. So he's applying dialectics to theology, which is scholasticism. And he acknowledged that there are some tenets of the faith that had to be held by faith alone, but there are many that will hold up to the scrutiny of rationalism. And Aquinas was the one who developed the hierarchical worldview, which says that everything has its place and that place is determined by God. It starts at the very bottom with like the algae, and then you have the plants, and then you have the animals, and then you have people, and then you have angels, and then you have God. So it is an ascending scale that goes from the bottom to the top. Dante Alighieri of Florence, Italy, and Geoffrey Chaucer of London, England, were considered the two greatest writers of the Middle Ages. Both wrote poems, and their poems showed a cross-section of medieval life that endures to this day and is why we know so much about the Middle Ages. Your book goes into a little bit of detail about Chaucer, gives you a little bit from the general prologue and from the wife of Bath, so I decided to delve into Dante. The picture that you see here was painted 200 years after um, Dante's death by Botticelli, who was one of the Renaissance painters of Florence, and in it we see him robed in regal red and wearing the crown of laurel leaves that was used for the Olympians in ancient Greece. So this just shows us how important Dante was to the people of his time and even afterward. You see here a little bit about Dante and when he lived, right smack in the middle of our time period of 1150 to 1300. He is a native of Florence, Italy. He was exiled from Florence in 1300 when his political party, the Whites, were upstage. There were the Whites and the Blacks, also called the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, and at alternate times, one or the other party was in power in Florence. And the power, that the one that was in power would kick the other one out. So Dante's party was kicked out in 1300, and that is when he wrote the Divine Comedy. Um, he was very committed to Italy, so much so 
that he believed that Christ could not come back until the Holy Roman Empire was resurrected. And so strong belief in the Roman Empire and in the Roman Catholic Church and much of the Divine Comedy concerns his beliefs um, about the Roman Catholic Church. The whole thing is um, a Christian work. And while he wrote several things, his masterpiece is the Divine Comedy in which you have a pilgrim who is Dante. He puts himself into his own work who goes through hell and then purgatory and then heaven to find his way to God. The Divine Comedy is an allegory. An allegory is a literary term that means something that stands for something else. And the whole entire work is a symbolic journey of a sinner trying to find his way back to truth, back to God. Dante is the pilgrim. He is the sinner who represents all of mankind who loses his way and needs to find his way back to God. The work begins on Good Friday in the year 1300 and ends on Easter Sunday morning. So, of course, that is symbolic of going from death to life. And the year 1300 was important astrologically because the stars were aligned in such a way that they had not been and were not again for some time to provide the perfect astrological sign. His guides are Virgil, the one who wrote um, the Aeneid during the time period of Augustine. Augustine commissioned Virgil to write the Aeneid for the Roman Empire. Beatrice, who was a woman that he fell in love with across the plaza. She represented perfect, holy love to him. He never married her, but she represented the purest form of love. And then St. Bernard, who was the patron saint of the Virgin Mary and who showed him his vision of God. First, the Divine Comedy is called a comedy because it ends happily. It begins in sorrow with our pilgrim in hell, but it ends happily with him in heaven seeing a vision of God. So that is a literary term that means that it ends happily and that it was written in the vernacular. Vernacular means that it was written in the common language of the people. So instead of being written in the official language of the empire, which was Latin, it was written in the common Italian so that the everyday person could read it. So there weren't that many people who were literate. But that's why it was a comedy, because it was written in the vernacular and it ends happily. The organization of the Divine Comedy all point to the Trinity, because everything is centered around the number three. There are three parts to the Divine Comedy. There is hell or the inferno. There is purgatory or purgatorio. And there is heaven or paradiso. And each of those sections has nine levels, which is three squared. So there are nine levels of hell, nine levels on the mountains of purgatory, and nine levels in um, paradise or heaven. The entire poem is 100 cantos, and a canto is just a chapter-like unit that we have divided up in the Divine Comedy. There are 33 cantos in each section, plus there is a beginning section called the Introduction, where we are introduced to Dante and where we see that he has lost his way in the woods and then his guide appears to him and starts taking him through hell. It is written with the Terzorama rhyme scheme. Terzorama means there are interlocking rhymes of three. So the rhyme scheme of the triplet, which a triplet is just a three line stanza, would be ABA. And then the rhyme scheme of the next triplet would be BCB. And of the next triplet would be CDC. So that middle line is the one that has the interlocking rhyme scheme. In the introduction to the poem, Dante loses his way in a dark wood in the middle of his life's journey, which a typical life is three score and 10 years, which is 70 years. So he's about 35 years old when he loses his way. And in the dark woods, he encounters a leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf. Each of those animals symbolize a certain sin. The leopard symbolizes fraud and all the sins that have to do with fraud or cheating somebody, betraying someone. The lion symbolizes all of the sins of violence and the she-wolf symbolizes all of the sins of incontinence. Incontinence here is not being able to control your bodily passions, whether that be eating or drinking or 
sex, um, any of those things that you're not able to control. The sinners in the different levels of hell, and remember there are nine levels, suffer symbolically. For instance, the gluttonous in level three suffer because they ate too much in life and so they were disgusting. So they um, are punished by being flailed by a cold, help, filthy rain, plus one of the mythological creatures, his name is Severus, a big three-headed dog, chews the sinners in his mouth and slobbers over them as they are pelted by this cold, filthy rain. Likewise, the saints in Paradiso are rewarded symbolically. For instance, in the first level of paradise, the theologians who are in the circle of the sun um, experience great warmth and light because of their enlightenment with knowing God during their lifetime. This painting by Michelino, who is also one of the Florentine Renaissance masters, shows the entirety of Dante's point. So you see here on the far left, these are the sinners in hell. These are the shades, the ghost, however you want to say it, but they are um, not physical bodies. They are like ghosts who are in hell, and you see they look distraught as they descend to the middle of the earth, and they are punished for their sins during this life. In the middle portion, you see the mountain of purgatory. You see there are seven levels here, but then there's the bottom level and the top level, which make nine. And so on each level of purgatory, the sinners are, they work off their sins. So they're, they're punished, but they're able to work them off. And every time they work off a level, the P that is on their forehead disappears. So they are able to go on to paradise because they work off their sins. In Catholic theology, these are the ones who did not confess their sins to a priest before they died. And so they have to work them off before they go on to heaven. And then on the far right, this is the city of God. Um, it's This main building is pictured very much like the Florence Cathedral. It's exactly what the cathedral looks like. And then you have all of these different levels in the top portion of the painting that show the different levels of heaven. And it's all the levels of the saints who are rewarded for their good deeds on earth. And right in the middle, you have Dante, again in red, and again with the laurel leaves um, on his head, showing his importance to the Florentine people.